And let us do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now join together in the prayer that we use during times of conflict, crisis, and disaster. O oh God, where hearts are fearful and constricted, grant courage and hope. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, grant peace and reassurance. Where impossibilities close every door and window, grant imagination and resistance. Where distrust twists our thinking, grant healing and illumination. Where spirits are daunted and weakened, grant soaring wings and strengthened dreams. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God, wherever we may be. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by His authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us now join together in the prayer of the day found in our bulletin answer. O oh God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son that we may gladly minister to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
first reading for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah 51. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. The word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We will now read responsibly from Psalm 138. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you are glorified in me and in the word of all things. <coughs> when I called you, you increased my strength within me. All the rulers of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord is high, and cares for the low, perceiving the hiding from the heart. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. You will make good your purpose for me. O Lord, your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The second reading is from Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Caesarea Philippi, 
he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on the earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. I don't know about you, but when I was young, I would always think about Jesus traveling with his disciples. I kind of pictured them like, well, like a hen and all of the chicks following behind. I guess if I was going to do a comparison, it would be like finishing up my grocery shopping and putting all my perishables in my trunk on a very hot day. And as I'm trying to leave the parking lot at Wegmans, those Canadian geese <laughs> all lined up, having to cross in front of my car. And of course they have one in the lead and like a million of them following behind all in a row. And that procession can take forever. But when you think about it, as lovely as a picture as it is, it is probably more like the people that we see on the, the bike trails at Prescott or maybe the people on the walking tracks at the health club. They don't go in single file lanes. They go spread out shoulder to shoulder, so that you can't get past them. But the real reason they do that is simply because they want to talk to one another. They want to hear what the other is saying, and they want to be able to communicate to the rest of the group. And so they kind of huddle around. I almost see Jesus and the disciples traveling that way. Maybe Jesus in the middle, three on either side, and six right behind them, so that while they're walking, Jesus to teach. And while he's teaching, he is using the Socratic method, he is asking questions. And in asking questions, it is then he hopes they might learn. Now he asked this, and we might, we might want to ask ourselves, why does he ask such a question? Who do people say that I am? Is he that insecure in what he's doing? Does he need to have popular polling numbers? Or rather, is it for a very special reason? Not for himself, but rather for his disciples. Not just the twelve, but for all of us. Who do people say that I am? Well, some of the disciples said, well, Jesus, there's talk. People think that you're John the Baptizer. Others think that you're Elijah. Still others think you're Jeremiah or another prophet. Now think about this. People are saying that this is John the Baptizer. Now by this time, we all know that John the Baptizer, who was the one who was out in the wilderness, who had been calling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, who baptized with water, proclaiming that there would be one greater who would baptize by fire, that by this time, he had been imprisoned and he had been beheaded by Herod. And so people think that this is John the Baptizer brought back to life. Now, it's not just the common people that think this. Listen to what we find in the Gospel of Mark. I believe it is in the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. 
Some were saying John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. Others said it is Elijah, and others said it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John whom I had beheaded has been raised. Now you all know what happens when somebody in power believes something. All of the other people around him, all of his yes men, start believing the same thing. So it's not unheard of that some of the people may have picked up on this. And they may have started to believe that yes, this could be John the Baptizer. But what are they saying in reality? That yes, it is possible that John the baptizer could be raised from the dead, but we don't believe that he is the Messiah. We will believe somebody can be raised from the dead, and we will believe that it could be John the baptizer, but there's no way he's the Messiah. Okay? Well, some others are believing that, that this is Elijah. Now, Elijah is probably considered one of the greatest of all the prophets. Elijah was the one who not only taught, but he healed. Not only did he heal, but he also fed a number of people in a way that really wasn't possible. Not only that, but he spoke the word of God. So some people were saying that he is Elijah. Now, that reminds me of something from Malachi. What is supposed to happen? According to Malachi in the fourth chapter, it says, Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. In other words, before God's kingdom comes, Elijah must reappear. And so these people are saying, yes, this has to be Elijah. This has to be the one that is going to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. In other words, we believe that it is possible that Jesus might be Elijah, but no way are we going to believe that he is the Messiah. Even though Jesus has fed the multitudes, not once, but twice. Not only has Jesus driven up demons, not only has he made the lame walk, the blind see, not only has he cast out demons, not only has he raised the dead, but people were willing to go so far as to say it is Elijah, but no, he's not the Messiah. Others were willing to say, well, he's like Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Now, Jeremiah, as we might recall, was a man who was called by God to proclaim God's word, and Jeremiah did just that. He was very zealous in his proclamation of what God had given him to say. And he spoke with authority. Well, that sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? And people were willing to concede that, yes, it is possible that Jeremiah is standing before us, even though he has been gone for hundreds of years. But we cannot believe that this man, Jesus, is the Messiah. You see, Jesus didn't fit their stereotype of a Messiah. You see, Jesus did not have a sword in his hand. Jesus was not built like Thor. Jesus did not come in on a white stallion. Jesus did not come in and kick the Romans back to Rome. Jesus came in proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come near and that God is a God of love, not a God that wants to punish people. That Jesus, instead of taking a sword and getting what he wants done, tells everybody that we need to pray for our enemies. Jesus tells us that if someone is in need, we should give them, why, even the shirt off our back. Doesn't sound much like a Messiah, does it? Doesn't sound like somebody's going to kick the snot out of all of our enemies. Doesn't sound like somebody's going to do everything we want them to do. And so they could not and would not be able to say that this was the Messiah. 
In fact, the only person who was ready to make that statement was Peter. You all remember Peter. Peter's the guy that has to say something no matter what. As one seminary professor said that the only time Peter opened his mouth was to change his foot. Because he kept sticking his foot in his mouth every time, he would often have to open his mouth so that he might be able to insert the other foot. So Peter speaks up and Peter says, he said, you are the Messiah, you are the son of the living God. The only one. The only one. And what does Jesus say? Does he say, Ad boy, Peter, pay the class today? Does he say, Peter, you get a pass from here on out, no matter what dumb stuff you're going to say or do, you're good. Because you got it right. No. What Jesus says to Peter is this Blessed are you, Simon Peter. For you couldn't have known this on your own. It's not like he said, Simon, you're too dumb to know this. What he was saying is, Simon, no one can come to the faith that you have come to except from God. That the only way that you could know this is from God. And you see, that's exactly how it is with us. That we cannot come to faith on our own. It is a gift from God. It is a gift of God. That as we come to this baptismal font, or to a lake, or to a river, wherever it is that we have been baptized, that is God who has brought us to that time and that place. Whether it is through our parents, our godparents, our grandparents, a friend, whomever it was that brought us to that place, it was by God doing so. And that in our baptism, we begin that relationship. God begins that relationship with us. And He gives us that faith. He reveals to us that Jesus Christ is indeed His Son. And that He is our Savior. That's very important for us. Why is it important for us? Well, Jesus thought it was so important that he wanted everybody to believe that because for him it is a matter of life and death. Not just here in this world, but in the life to come. You see, Jesus said that you have to know me before you can know my father. There is no way into the kingdom of heaven without knowing me. In other words, we must believe, as Peter believed, that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Because without that belief, we cannot enter into God's kingdom. And that is why Jesus said, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. He wasn't saying, Peter, I'm going to build my church on you. I'm going to build my church on that statement of faith. That I am indeed the Son of God. That I am indeed the Savior of the world. On that, my church will be built. On that rock, not even the gates of hell can stand up against. That all who believe that will have eternal life. All who believe that will know me. And my Father will know them that if they trust in me, no matter what happens going on here, one day they will be in my Father's kingdom with me. You know, we look back on readings such as this and we might look at these crowds and say, why is it that they can believe this? How is it they might be able to say, well, he's Elijah, he's John the Baptizer, He's Jeremiah or one of the other prophets, but not believe that he is indeed the Son of God. Well, we confront that every day of our lives, don't we? We run into people who cannot believe what we believe. 
There are a lot of people who might say that Jesus was a great teacher, and they're willing to give him this prayer. They might even say that he is indeed a prophet of God, and they're willing to go that far. Most people will say that he's a great example to live our lives by, and you will be in complete agreement. But where we get into a lot of trouble is when we say that he is our Savior, and that he is the Son of God. That's when the fight starts. Because there's a lot of people that are not willing to acknowledge that. There's a lot of people who are not willing to believe that. And yet that is the truth. That is the rock on which our faith is built. It is what we believe, and I hope that is what you believe. And if I was to ask each and every one of you, who is it that you say Jesus is? I pray that we might all truly believe that he is the Son of God, that he is our salvation. That matters. It matters not just to me, and it truly matters to me, but it matters to God. That God has revealed this to you. And he so much wants you to understand this and know this. He wants you to know this in every fiber of your being. He wants you to know this and it has it in your whole essence in life. Just as breathing in and breathing out becomes so natural, so should your faith that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. And yet sometimes many of us who are faithful Many of us who come to church every day who say our prayers, we forget that. No? How many of us will when, well, when we get some bad news or maybe when we are confronted with something that is very overwhelming, how many of us will do everything in our power to take care of it instead of putting it in the hands of the one who can take care of it? You see, when we try to do it on our own, we are saying, God, I really don't trust you. God, I believe I've got this. If we really believe he is our Lord and Savior, then would we not first hand it to him? Would we not place it at his feet and say, God, I trust you. You are my Lord, you are my Savior, and with this little thing that's going on in my life, even though it seems like it's a mountain, you can handle it. And yet we don't. There are many ways that we deny God, just as Peter denied God. And thankfully, our Lord is such a loving God that no matter how much we screw up, no matter how many times we may deny Him, no matter how many times we think we know better, we can turn around and we can see Jesus with His arms out. Those same arms that were nailed to the cross are open for us. That Jesus says to you, I love you. That no matter what, you are my beloved. Trust in me. Believe in me. Know the joy of your Father. And one day, you will know the joy of his kingdom. Who is Jesus? Hope we can all say it. He is my Lord, my God, and my Savior. And in knowing this, in believing this, in trusting in this, that we might be able to share this good news with others that we meet, mostly in our actions, maybe sometimes in our words, so that all might come to truly know.
And now let us join together and express our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all our, who are in need. Lord, our rock, you are our foundation in Jesus Christ, your Son, whom we confess as the living God. Prepare your church for its mission in bearing witness to Christ, both here at home and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. You call forth praises from the far reaches of the universe to the smallest of creatures. Join our songs to theirs, that a spirit of praise and thanksgiving will arouse us to cherish this wondrous home you give us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. Direct the leaders of countries, legislators and magistrates, mayors and councils to walk in your ways. Help leaders regard those in need with mercy and fulfill your loving purposes in the governance of peoples. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve Preserve us, deliver us, and fulfill your purpose for us. According to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to those who are bereaved, in trouble or adversity, or sick and in need of care. Lord, in your mercy. In our prayer. You call us into this community in which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and in one another the unique gifts you have given us for the building up of the church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You are the everlasting rock from which we were hewn, and you restore your people to joy and gladness. In blessed memory and hope, we thank you for the lives of our beloved dead. Bring us with them to our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you today our friends, our family, our loved ones, those that we may not know. But we lift up and entrust into your hands all of your children. Father, we pray for their healing, their restoration, their wholeness. We pray for your guidance, your peace, but most of all, Father, your presence in their lives. We pray today for Bill, Kelsey, Rich, Roger, Josh, Cindy, Mary, Norma, Eloise, Kathy, Fran, Eric, Sue, Dick, Charlotte, we pray for Sue and Tom as they are going to be undergoing procedures. And we pray, Father, for Joe as he is going to be taking his boards. And as he continues onward, we ask, Father, that you bless him, that he may know that he is going to touch the lives of many people and that he is going to be healing so many. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you Cheryl's family as they mourn her loss. And we pray, Father, that even in this darkness, your light shines through. Let them know, Father, that as we have been baptized into a life and death like Jesus's, we have also been baptized in a resurrection like his. Father, we pray for Shirley, for Laura, 
We pray for Darlene, for Elizabeth, Rosa, Bensi. We pray for Elaine. We pray for Bob. Heavenly Father, we continue to give you thanks for all of your healing in this world. We pray most of all, Father, for your healing of those who are battling with any types of addictions. We pray that they might hear the good news that they are loved by you and that all can be forgiven and that all can be made whole in you. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O oh God. We give you thanks and praise. By your word, you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and grace. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and grace. Send your spirit of truth, O oh God, Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of the world in need. Faithful to your word, O oh God, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God of all power and love, we give thanks for your unfailing presence, and the hope you provide in times of uncertainty and loss. Send your Holy Spirit to enkindle in us your holy fire. Revive us to live as Christ's body in the world, a people who pray, worship, learn, break bread, share life, heal neighbors, bear good news, seek justice, rest and grow in the Spirit. Wherever and however we gather, unite us in common prayer and send us in common mission that we and the whole creation might be restored and renewed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, you are the God of peace and love in whom we place our trust. Give us peaceful hearts that rest in you and a loving spirit that pours forth your love to others. Lord, you are the God of comfort and rest in whom we put our hope. Give us hearts that abide in you, so that your comfort may stream through us to others who need comfort and strength. Lord, you are the God of hope and joy in whom we stand secure. Give us a spirit of devotion that worships only you, so that we may be a worthy witness that points to Jesus. For him is all peace and love and comfort and rest and hope and joy and love. 